Mayor, please be seated. And please continue to enjoy your breakfast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the EDC's first roundtable of 2015. As many of you will recall, the EDC held three forward-looking roundtable events last year, uh, focused on topics like education and workforce development, uh, transportation and entrepreneurship. Today's roundtable is going to be a bit different in that rather than looking forward, we're going to take some time today to look back and explore the evolution of some of the most important sectors to our local economy over the past hundred years. After all, it's been said that you can't truly know where you're going until you understand where you've been. And what better time to understand where we've been than here in 2015 and the centennial of our great county. But before we delve into our program today, we have some folks that we need to acknowledge this morning. I'd like to acknowledge all present elected officials. We have members of the Okaloosa County Commission here. Commissioners, would you please stand and be recognized? We also have elected leaders from Destin, Fort Walton Beach, Mary Esther, Niceville, Valparaiso, and the Okaloosa County School District here with us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you, Thank you all for your service. We always have some great sponsors, and today is no exception. You all know that we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't offer these events to the level that we offer them without great sponsors. And today we're very pleased to have four wonderful sponsors uh, with us today. Shellco uh, is here. We also have Gulf Power as a sponsor. Thank you all. Uh, we have North Okaloosa Medical Center as a sponsor. And we also have Warren Averett. And it's amazing that they have so many folks here in the middle of tax season. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce the EDC's uh, fiscal year 2015 chairman, Ron Moliterno. When Ron took office as our chairman back in October, he put forth a vision uh, for what he referred to as the heart and soul of the American economy. He talked about manufacturing and small business development as being important to our, uh, to our area and being a focus for the EDC this year. And Six months in, we were just talking about that at the table this morning, and all is well, and those two things are at the forefront of everything your EDC is doing and today is no different. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan Moliterno. Thank you, Nathan. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. What a fantastic day. I want to thank Ted and Shane and Ed Schrader for today's weather. Thank you very much. This is really a, a good-looking group, and I'm really proud to be standing up here in front of you. Uh, I know that I've really been looking forward to today's panel discussion, so I really want to get things rolling so we have plenty of time to do that. Uh, before we start, I would like to ask all the members of the EDC's Executive Committee to please stand and be recognized. Are you all here? A, a very a terrific group of hardworking people and smart people. And, Again, very thankful to have them uh, as part of my year as chairman. Well, today it's my responsibility and my privilege to introduce our distinguished moderator and panelist. I'd ask you to look in your programs for their full bios, because I'm only going to do a, a brief introduction. And I would ask you all to step up to the table when I introduce you. Our moderator is a lifelong educator, an author, and a friend to all. He was named Northwest Florida's Economic Development Volunteer of the Year three times, not to mention being the co-founder of the EDC and two times chairman. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. David Getch. Our first panelist, is a lifelong Destin area resident. He is a third generation Destin fisherman, retired Navy quartermaster, and he now serves as an Okaloosa County Commissioner. Please welcome Commissioner and Captain Kelly Wines. Our next panelist will go down in Okaloosa County history not only for his incredible record of leadership in the U.S. Air Force, 
but for his role in changing the physical and economical landscape of our community through his role as chairman of the Mid-Bay Bridge Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, General Gordy Fournette. Our next panelist leads the marketing efforts and uh, gets to sell arguably our greatest assets, our beaches and the beautiful magnetism that is Okaloosa County. He came to our county in 2013 with a fine record of accomplishment. And he has done an exceptional job in, in what could be a very challenging position, to say the least. Very happy to have you here today, TDD Director Ed Schrader. And last, but certainly not least, this panelist is a champion for economic development. He has served our county well as a leader in diversifying our economy through manufacturing. Please welcome the CEO of Fort Walton Machining, Chairman of the Northwest Florida Manufacturing Council, and most importantly, Vice Chair of the EDC, Greg Britton. Okay, you know what my job is, is to get you back to work on time. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, we have four panelists today representing four sectors. Those four sectors represent 40,000 jobs. Not bad. Give them a hand. What represents more jobs than that, though, is those of you out there in sectors who are not represented on the panel. Our original panel had 20 members. They were each going to have 30 seconds to cover 100 years. <laughs> so we had to narrow it down a little bit. And it's still going to be tough. Each of these guys will have 10 minutes to give you 100 years of background, uh, 80 in the case of General Fornell, um, Air Force still being a baby and all that. Go Marines, 200 something years. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump in and get real st uh, started. We're going to start down on that end and work this way. Gentlemen, I'm going to sit right over here. I'll give you a two minute warning, a one minute warning. When you see me slashing and coming to the podium, you're done. Um, they're going to speak from here, but they will answer questions from here. One more thing, to keep us from having to pay about $10 each to get over the Mid-Bay Bridge, Gordy is on his way to New York today to refinance some bonds for us. So he's going to, yeah, very good for the economy, Ed, good for the economy. So uh, he's going to speak last, but he's going to take your questions first. And then as soon as he's heard your questions and answered them, he's going to have to hit the road, uh, hit the door running. So let's, uh, let's begin. And Kelly, if you'd like to start, 10 minutes to tell us everything in the world that's happened in 100 years in fishing. Thank you, David. I appreciate everybody coming out. I'm, I'm honored to be here and uh, tell a few fish stories. Um, I've been fishing about 40 years. My dad was a fisherman as well as his dad, and also my son is 28 now as a charter boat captain. Um, when I started fishing in the 60s, there was seven or eight charter boats, probably 15 or 18 sane boats, and four, five, six party boats. Uh, along the years, it's evolved to where now there's 125 uh, big charter boats, 25 or so small back bay boats, uh, which makes up the largest and most modern charter fishing fleet in the state of Florida. Not too shabby, huh? Uh, the luckiest fishing village in the world, back in the 50s, probably the late 50s, Leroy Collins, a former Florida governor, came fishing and he got on the Miss Barbara Ann with Captain Redden, Salty Brunson, and Salty was a good name for him. He was a crusty character. <laughs> Redden died uh, about a year ago, I think, and he was 100 years old. And he could tell you some sure enough stories. But at any rate, the phrase was coined, the luckiest fishing village in the world. The governor got on the bar brand, went fishing. Within 30 minutes, it caught a 40-pound King Michael. Came back to the radio where people were there, and he announced that this has got to be the luckiest fishing village in the world. And it stuck all this time, so that was all right. Uh, there's some reasons that we are pretty lucky, uh, some of them geographical. We've got uh, our boats, our fleet is very close to deep water. The DeSoto Canyon is 65 miles away, that's where you catch the marlin and the sailfish and the 
big tunas and whatnot to sport fishing. Uh, we can be fishing in 10 to 15 minutes from our docks, depending on where in Old Pasadena you tie up. At the east end, it might take you five minutes longer, four minutes longer to get there. But in the, our competitive areas, east and west of us, Pensacola and Panama City, they got some of them a 30 minute run just to get to the big water. So that gives us a big advantage. Instant access is a, is a good thing. We, uh, we've got these beautiful beaches to complement the fishing, so it gives the families a more complete uh, vacation. Mom and the kids can go to the beach or they can go shopping, and while dad and the uncle and the son, they might choose to go fishing. So it's a pretty good equation. Another thing that helps us, uh, we have a, what's called a shallow water port here at East Pass. Big shipping can't get in there. That's really a good thing in some respects because our water quality stays good, clean, and, and pretty. And uh, there's no paper mills right here. We got the east and west of us, of course. And, uh, so we have light industry. Yeah, we could use some more of it, guys. I know. <laughs> um, we also we have a great variety of fish. We can fish inshore in the bays, and we we can catch. Uh, speckled trout, redfish, sheep's head, uh, it goes, even tarpon, it goes on and on. Lots of close by fishing in the bay for the smaller boats to fish, or you can fish in there when it's rough weather. Uh, close by in the Gulf, in the inshore waters, we got king mackerel, we got bonita, Spanish mackerel, and this time of the year, cobia fishing is the big thing. I don't see any boats out there right now, but you will, as they, this is a beautiful day, conditions are good for cobia fishing. Cobia fishing, uh, cobias average about 30 pounds a piece. They're excellent game fish, very good table fare. No fishing report would be adequate unless you had at least one fish story in there. It's 1981. The last year was my first boat I ever had, which was a wood boat. I had a new boat being built by GNS Boats, and I was so excited. But this was the last year there was a cobia tournament going on. I was tying up at the Harbor Docks. Every fish story begins with, we were going along. <laughs> so we're down west of the pier around the houses at Navarre. We were going along. I looked in there inside the gully in about six, eight feet of water. Had to get across the sandbar to get there. And of course, there's a four or five foot sea running, which was good because it kept the small boats out of the shallow water. We could get in there. Uh, now, I had to be careful with this next term. I call those small boats monkey boats. Chubby Destin coined that phrase, way, that phrase way back in the 60s because of the way they operated these boats. But one time at the commission, before I got aboard, I was talking about monkey boats and, uh, and a wake zone issue. And this voice, I said monkey boats, and this voice booms out from up on the uh, dais and it said, wait a minute. And it was Bill Roberts. He had him a small boat. <laughs> so Bill, that was a term of endearment. Uh, so we're going along, we look in there, I see this big black mass of fish, I think it must be porpoises, it's way too much to be to be cobia. So I got closer and closer and all the small boats were offshore, so I said, well I'm going in there, look, got in the gully, and here's a big water cobia, and they're around a big greenback turtle that had fouled himself on a on a poly rope, a hawser, a three inch rope. And the thing was, the rope was about 60 feet long, and the cobias were just all around him. So I had this boy, Rob North, where he was my mate. He was the best cobia fisherman I'd ever seen. He had three or four of them hooked before I could blink an eye, passing rods down there. At any rate, to make a long story short, there was 20 fish in the school. We catch 19 of them. Uh, two of them were over 90 pounds, and one was 111. Still the biggest one I'd ever caught. So Rob comes up on the bridge. We're going home. We got the fish ice. We got them laying on deck. We got them in the live well. We, we thought we were really something, and we were. Rob, <laughs> Rob says, uh, Captain said, that was a heck of a bite of fish. I said, yeah. I said, how come you lost the last one on the gap? We'd have had all 20 of them. <laughs> but offshore fishing, we got sailfish, white marlin, blue milk marlin, yellowfin tunas, black fins, about 65 miles to the canyon, and it's about 42 nautical miles to the uh, 100 fathom curve, which most boats fish around in there. At the reef fishing, we have uh, snapper grouper, warsaw grouper, amberjack scamps, many others in the variety. Destin boats still to this day hold the uh, all tackle IGFA world records for gag grouper in Warsaw. Destin fishermen over the years have taken steps to sustain their industry and protect their future. In 1989, the Destin Fisherman's Co-op was formed and has approximately 85 members. 
The co-op is nonprofit, furnishes fuel bait items and catalog sales at a discounted price to the members. 49% of its annual gross receipts come from non-members, which help keep prices down for the members. This organization, the uh, Destin Charter Boat Association, is the next one that uh, was organized to uh, to send members and fund their travel time, of course, to go to various federal and state meetings to fight the regulations, which has become more and more quite the quite the battle. Um, the Destin Fishing Fleet Marina uh, was founded in 1992. It's owned by 42 families of fishermen that saw a need to secure a place to do business and remain somewhat independent in their chosen profession. We have 40 permanent boat slips that accommodate boats from 30 to 72 feet, all fair carrying charter and head boats, no private boats, no monkey boats bill. <laughs> also on site are seafood restaurant, business officials, and the Destin Fishermen's Co-op. In an effort to keep fishermen involved, the bylaws of the company, the, the Fleet Marina, allows for a limited number of new shareholders each year, but they must be up-and-coming fishermen and licensed boat captains. Um, what does fishing in Destin contribute to Okaloosa County and the city of Destin economy-wise? In September of 2014, the city of Destin hired a Pensacola-based firm to collect, analyze, and distribute economic data on the impact of charter fishing and recreational boating in the Destin Harbor. A few of the high points, according to the Haas Center summary, are as follows. 2,500 jobs, directly or indirectly supported by fishing. Approximately 300,000 visitors travel to Destin annually to participate. Almost a quarter billion dollars in total economic output. This number accounts for 16% and 18% of the gross regional product. Some of our problems or challenges are the way federal and state fisheries are managed. The powers that be have trouble adhering to the number one rule of doing business, keep the customer in mind. What I mean by that is they, they set the seasons inconsistent from year to year. Last year, the red snapper season in federal waters was for nine days. This year, depending on what is signed into law, it could be up to 45-day season, so we're heading in the right direction. But that makes it tough for a family to plan their vacation if they're going to plan it around fishing. Uh, in this age of electronic wizardry, we could have reporting requirements that could gather real data and our seasons could be more consistent and be extended substantially. I believe that the resource and the fish and the fishermen would win. At present, the Gulf of Mexico, the total allowable catch is 11 million pounds. It's divided basically half and half between commercial and recreational. The National Marine Fisheries sets the rules in federal waters in the Gulf. These waters are outside nine miles. The state of Florida sets the rules inside of nine miles for state waters. These rules and regulations are set on what is termed the best available science, which leaves a lot to be desired. In the Gulf, the commercial fishermen have, a, which is about 400 boats as commercial fishermen, have a very dependable, accurate electronic reporting system, which takes all the guesswork out of the equation. In the head boat sector, 17 party boats use the same system. They can catch snapper almost year round under a tagging program. So what we're trying to do in the recreational sector is get a comparable system. Um, one more fish story before I close. This is about marine electronics. Over the years, um, radars, plotters, radios, scanners, all the equipment has just made it real easy. You can almost be an instant boat captain. You don't have to have 40 years of experience to do it. If you ever get a number on a place, you can go right back to it. So uh, about 10 years ago, my boy was fishing with me. He was about 18, 19. We were commercial fishing basically in the middle of the Gulf, 253 miles southwest of Destin in what's called Green Canyon. We were fishing for yellowfin tunas. It was early in December and the boys on deck used to say, we're going to catch Santa Claus. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the weather, the weather was on the make. The weather was a little tough, but we were scrapping. We had a, a slow trip, but enough to make it worthwhile. But I had cut the trip short about three days. I got back in, I told my wife, I said, you know, if I had this plotter that Peruno makes, this Japanese company, I, I could have seen that front coming and got a good weather report and stayed another two or three days and made a heck of a trip. I said, we really would have caught Santa Claus. She said, well, how much does that plotter cost? I said, well, it costs about $7,000. I know it's big. We always talk about a big item, whether it's her business or mine, and we decided we're going to do it. 
So uh, she said, I don't know, that's a lot of money. I said, well, you know, uh, Trebo, that's our son, or, or he's a licensed boat captain. He was 19 at the time. I said, you know, Trebo's going to be going with me all, all those trips. And way out there in the middle of the Gulf, well, it's dangerous when the northern <laughs> <laughs> She said, Trebo's going? I said, yeah. She said, well, how much does it cost and how quick can we get it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done, Kelly. Thank you for that. And now Greg Britton will take us through the uh, 100 years of manufacturing. Got to bring this down a little bit more. So, uh, you know, when Nathan asked me to do this, I'm thinking, I know a little bit about manufacturing, but I really know a little bit about fishing, too. So I'm thinking, I got to weave some fishing in here. And, uh, you know, I know a little bit about fishing. I know there's three sizes of fish. There's one size that when you put, put it in the boat, it's this big, right? When you get home, it's this big. And by golly, the next day at work, it's huge. So uh, I know a little bit about fishing. I can manufacture some good fishing stories. So, you know, another thing that I thought was manufacturing hasn't been in this area that long, if you really think about it. Um, so it was very hard to get in and find a lot of statistics about manufacturing and where we've come from. But um, what I did find was, is, you know, of course, manufacturing started with our natural resources. Whether that was timbering and sawmills um, to make lumber for housing and, and those kind of things. Or whether it was, uh, one of the big things was turpentine production. That was about in the 18, early 1900s, I guess, 1870, I think is when it kind of started in the area. And from what I found, it really started in the north around Baker and those areas. And then one thing I did find that was kind of interesting, I couldn't uh, confirm it by any other source than I think it was in the Baker Museum, was that they were known as the tongue tree oil capital of the world for a while, it was 1930s. And um, just an interesting fact, I guess the tongue tree came from China in 1905. So somebody brought the seeds over here and planted them. So it wasn't really our natural resource other than the pine trees themselves for the turpentine production. So if I really look at manufacturing, when did it start? It was right around, really, in 1935 when Aitlin Air Force was built. That was what drew manufacturing to this area. If you, if you think about all the, the, the pop-up companies that support the base and, and where those are at today, and it, and it may not even be direct manufacturing. There's a lot of just engineering firms that pop up around the base that support the base that then outsource to companies like a Fort Walton machine or somebody else like that in the, in the, in the community. But, uh, you know, Harris Corporation was here for a while, and I, I saw Dr. Shu, uh, one of the great business, businessmen, businessmen, if I can say it, businessmen in Okaloosa County. Uh, he started MTI, and that was one of the, the major companies I looked at. So great job there, Dr. Shu. Um, it's now BAE, of course. So, you know, there's been some companies that have changed. Metric Systems is now DRS. Um, and I think there were some changes in between there as well. Uh, if you look, we got Lockheed Martin here today that supports the F-35. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That's one of the, the big things on the, on the agenda. Ferris wheel, fish hooks, Ferris wheels, and F-35s, right? Uh, Boeing is local here. They do some manufacturing as well, not like a machining manufacturer, but they assemble some product and support the, uh, the base out there. Raytheon's here, and of course I said there's a lot of smaller companies that are in the area as well that, that support um, manufacturing and as well uh, the base. So, I'll, you know, for, from my standpoint, Fort Walton Machining was started because of Eglin Air Force Base and Herbert Field. It was started in 1987, and there was just four individuals in the company. And it, it's grown today to about 200 employees. And it's diversified. You know, it was just aerospace and defense manufacturing. And then we got into medical. And I didn't get to full machine until about 2002. So that's really where my memories start. And when I got there, we were about 56 employees at the time, nearing 60. And uh, we were probably about 60% aerospace defense and 40% medical. Um, from that standpoint. And one of our largest company customers was one company, which was medical, which was about 40% of our business. So when I took over in 2004, one of my 
deals was uh, I don't like anybody to be more than 40% of our business, you know, any more than 20% of our business. So 40% scared me. So we started diversifying, and today we have oil and gas. We do we do a lot of cutter heads for the, the that drills the holes for the oil industry. We have medical, which uh, one of our largest customers is Johnson Johnson. We produce all the tooling that runs through the line for contact lenses. Um, you, we have Walt Disney World, believe it or not, as a customer. We do a lot of seat belts for them. It's high tech. It's it's important. Liability issues. We have the systems in place that we do that, as well as, um, of course, a lot of different aircraft platforms we work on, which are C-130s, with, which really we do in the MRO world, which is maintenance, repair, and overhaul. And then as well, we support the F-35. At one time, we had about 287 unique part numbers for the F-35. that We produce one of the largest suppliers for the F-35. We produce all the floor panels that the, the floors for the CH-47 helicopter and then as well as um, some other floors for the CH-53K and such. So the, uh, the company's pretty diverse today. Uh, you can see that the Economic Development Council is working on bringing manufacturing to this area, and I think it's very important, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well in, in, the, in, the, in the future here. But one other company I want to mention, because it is a large company, is L3 up in Crestview. They do a lot of defense manufacturing as well. They, uh, they make the cabins for the CH-47 helicopter, and they make cabins, I believe, for the Bell UH-1Y, and a lot of other military-type aircraft um, uh, product. But if you look now at where Okaloosa County is at, it, it's a pretty diversified manufacturing base today. You know, you don't think about it, but you have G Gelato. You know, GS Gelato manufactures Gelato right here in Fort Walton Beach, and very, very successful company. And if you ever, if you attended the Gulf Power Symposium, uh, she, one of the gals there, I can't remember her name now, was a speaker for Gulf Power, and she was the owner of GS Gelato. And um, so, you know, they, they sell to Kroger's and Target, and if you go on their, their website, so they, they have a pretty well diversified and, and distri distribution uh, type system. It's, it's a unique, go on your website, it's pretty interesting. So. The other thing is we have custom cabinet manufacturing here locally. We have aircraft maintenance modification we talked about. Some aerospace components, not only defense, but now commercial starting to bring into the mix here. Automotive and marine manufacturing. We have architectural type manufacturing. We have, uh, you know, hurricane doors and windows manufacturing, garage door manufacturers. We have radar avionics communication manufacturing equipment. So this gets manufactured here right in Oklahoma County. Circuit card assemblies as well. And electronic and controls instrumentation. So, you know, there is a very diverse manufacturing economy that we see today. What I, so I'm going to take a little bit off track here because we're only about 80 years or maybe 85 years into manufacturing. And we, we're saying we want to go 100 years. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see the future. And this is just my opinion, um, and, and so it's not supported by everybody in the room, of course, on the EDC, but I've done a lot of traveling lately, and I've traveled to Paris, I've traveled uh, to Farnborough, I've traveled to Hamburg now twice, and I've, I've went to these shows and heard um, things, and, and you know, about this area specifically. And you know, with Airbus being planted in Mobile, that was that was one of my targets. What I, so I want to start traveling overseas and see what's going on, and try to diversify four walt machining into international type manufacturing as well. And there's a lot of buzz about this area. What's the what's the area like? You know, can you support manufacturing? Do you have the workforce to do that? Are the educational programs there to do that? And I, I really believe that this area is unique. And, and I, I'm proud to be a part of this area. I'm going to be honest with you. And when I was in Indiana, and that's where I'm originally from, it was all about what's in it for me, right? And I see the Nathan Sparks of the world, and, and Larry Sassano's with Florida Great Northwest, and Gulf Power, and uh, Power South, and everybody working together in collaboration to make this area something big. And I think that's important. I think that, that, that showing that we're one team to bring 
manufacturing this area. It's working, guys. I see it. I mean, there is there is all kinds of things that are going on. Uh, you know, the, the the programs or the excuse me, the projects that the EDC has seen. There's 50 some percent that are manufacturing, and the largest project list that we've had. And that's another good uh, kudos to, to Nathan and his team, you know, Kay and, and uh, Caroline, because they're having to turn these projects quick. They're wanting instantaneous results. So, you know, going forward, you know, we, we focused a lot on education, and I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about the Manufacturers Council, not a lot, but, you know, that was one of the things of why the Manufacturers Council was formed. We saw a need to ensure that we had a good workforce here. And, and we don't leave kids behind. And, you know, we've got a great workforce with the military, you know, incumbent training and stuff like that. We're doing through the tech man and tech men and stuff like that to ensure that we're developing a generation of folks that can, can work in a manufacturing environment and support those businesses that we hope <coughs> will come here one day. So as far as the manufacturing camps, that's our vision. That's our, our, our future is right now laser focused on, on education. We, we you know, have received 1.5 million in conjunction with UWF to bring in some manufacturing academies, career academies here. Six in total, one in Okaloosa, one in Santa Rosa, one in Scambia, one in Bay, one in Walton, and then the, and there's a, a rural uh, as well academy that's, that's coming up. And those manufacturing academies are spent, are, are basically 80% of everything those kids will learn will go into any kind of manufacturing, whether it's chemical, paper, machining, and then there's a 20% flavor there. So I really think that in a few years, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, I can't put a number on it. But I think that we'll say, look what we've got here in Okaloosa County for manufacturing. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Well done. Dave, would you like to come tell us about tourism? Well, Kelly started this out uh, in 1950 with a visit from the governor. I'm going to go back a little further. Uh, to crank up the tourism story in our county. In fact, I'm going all the way back to the uh, War of Northern Aggression <laughs> when uh, uh, we had a Yankee down here, a New England fisherman named Leonard Dustin. Uh, at, during that war, uh, he didn't speak with the same dialect that you might hear from Captain Wines. Uh, he was clearly a, a Yankee, and so he was interned uh, under suspicion. So uh, he spent uh, that war uh, as prisoner, uh, but towards the end was released and he came back uh, to his home here uh, in East Pass. It wasn't Destin then, it was East Pass. And uh, he went back to fishing. Well, he teamed up with this Georgia boy named uh, Bill Marler and uh, they began their, their fishing career and uh, I, I wouldn't say that's the beginning of fishing in our in our community, but it's one of the earliest uh, uh, fishing groups, uh, and it only grew from there. Uh, supporting that uh, growing fishing fleet, there were there were no hotels, there were no condos. Uh, what you had is cottages and people's homes, and uh, just the occasional uh, overnight stay. Uh, but uh, things began to grow around the early 1900s. Uh, as these fishermen uh, wanted to sell their fish, they started moving towards distribution points or over in Pensacola. So uh, on their way to Pensacola, they found they, they got about here, uh, actually just a little bit further over into uh, Santa Rosa Sound, and uh, they wanted to stay overnight and eat a meal. And so in 1906, our first hotel, the Gulf View Hotel, was uh, built, uh, just a few rooms. And uh, then six years later, it was joined, joined by the Indianola Inn, uh, built by one of the founding father, fathers on this side of the county, uh, which was uh, Thomas Brooks. Um, that carried us through till about 1920, when there was a game changer. And that game changer was prohibition. Uh, that kind of changed the metrics of our fishing fleet a little bit. 
Uh, besides fishing, we had some boats, boats that uh, did a little bit of uh, bootlegging, some rum running, and some new centers of entertainment grew up in our county. Uh, James Flew uh, was a Chicago native, came down here and saw an opportunity. He built the Valparaiso Inn in, uh, in 1922. And it had gaming, and it certainly, uh, during Prohibition, uh, served a, a special drink now and again. Um, and uh, he brought a lot of his friends from Chicago down here to enjoy that very special setting at the Valparaiso Inn. We have some of those uh, rich Chicago folks and other people, uh, the friends they had from up north, decided that they, they saw an opportunity down here. And uh, this northern group of investors proposed the Port Dixie development. And uh, I think this is true. It might not be, but I, but I think it's true. Uh, their, their proposal was a deep water channel. Uh, it was sanctioned by the House of Representatives and, and House of Representatives. And they tasked uh, the War Department um, for authorization for this uh, to dig a 300 foot deep channel, 8,600 feet long and 300 feet wide through the Old East Pass. I guess they thought we were gonna be the next New Orleans. Um, unfortunately, a couple things failed. It, like many great projects, they hit the Corps of Engineers and fell dead. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Corps of Engineers said it's too hard, too deep, too expensive, can't do it. That killed another aspect that had to happen for this, and that was a railroad to connect up to the northern railroad lines. So those two things fell through, and that uh, ambition was lost. Uh, but still, the uh, focus uh, now moved down towards, uh, down towards uh, Fort Walton Beach. In 1928, Thomas Brooks built the uh, Tower Beach uh, Casino and, uh, and uh, Boardwalk. Had a dance pavilion, had a restaurant, 40 cottages. Interesting thing about his development, that with those 40 cottages, he did not have one overnight stay during the first year that he was open. I can't explain why, but folks didn't trust the Barrier Islands back then, I guess. Uh, about this time, there was, uh, and throughout this period, especially after Prohibition, our area became known as the playground of the South come down here for gambling, you come down here for spirits, and you could sure do some fine fishing. Uh, well, there was another game changer in 1933-1934, and that's when the Brooks Bridge was first built, uh, the Destin Bridge was built, and Highway 98 was paid. Believe it or not, when our county was formed back in uh, 1915, there was not a single paved road in the whole county. Uh, but in 34, Highway 98 opened, and that opened the floodgates to development here. Uh, you get into the World War II years, and uh, we hadn't given up gambling yet. In fact, uh, Roger Clary uh, opened up the Shalimar Club, uh, and that became Gaming Center. Uh, although not technically legal, uh, the, sheriff, uh, the county sheriff, as well as the uh, uh, other constables in the area overlooked that fact and allowed them to operate until about 1950 when um, there was just too much public clamor over gambling taking place and the other things that happened around gambling. Um, so he eventually had to close those doors and in 1950 uh, he moved his attention down here to Fort Walton Beach as well um, and built the uh, uh, built the Silver Beach Cottages over there in Fort Walton Beach. Very interesting thing happened back in 1945 in the World War Two years. As the story goes, there's four gentlemen that were at, uh, remember back then there was the Old East Pass, not the current East Pass. That was a much smaller pass than what we have now, and the bay would really fill up when there was a heavy influx of water. Well, there was four ge gentlemen led by uh, D.T. Melvin who wanted to do something about that. It was too high for their liking. So where the current East Pass is, the four men took shovels and they shoveled a little channel 
all the way across that spit of land to relieve some of that pressure. Well, in just a few hours, the water rushing through that little channel they dug, uh, it was now 300 feet wide and deep enough for boat traffic. I'm sure they had no idea what they were creating, uh, but that is where the East Pass uh, got its uh, beginning. Uh, 1948, uh, Oakaloosa Island was deeded to the county, uh, and that's really important because now you can kind of see some development start to take place on uh, Oakaloosa Island. As I said, in 1950, Roger Clary built the Silver Beach uh, Cottages. Uh, that was, um, there were other small, very small houses and cottages that were built in the area, but in, uh, in 1955, is when uh, things really cranked up and that uh, kind of opens up to the next era which is we give up our title as playground of the south and we're now the miracle strip and uh, the gulf area opened in 1955 brilliant marketing idea they put this giant cut out of a porpoise on front if you remember back in those days in the 50s and 60s and i think even all the way to the 70s Flipper was one of the primary shows on television, and um, um, they certainly leveraged that uh, to the hilt uh, to get notori notoriety around the uh, country. Uh, another thing they had back then was the goofy golf that showed up, and uh, some bizarre creatures that would show up on those goofy golf uh, playgrounds. Uh, I think the most extreme that I saw was there was a crazed man with his arm outstretched hand holding the head of, of a young woman. Uh, I don't know what that has to do with goofy, goofy golf, but that was part of what you had to go through uh, while you were there. Uh, VPS opens in 1957, and, uh, and then uh, to continue with the amusement theme of the Miracle Strip, you had the uh, Okaloosa Island Park and the uh, Funway Amusement Park where we had the Ferris wheel and roller coasters. And that roller coaster went on until 1989 uh, when it closed. However, the, the coaster didn't die. Uh, in fact, it stood there as a blight on this community uh, until 1995 uh, when Hurricane Opal uh, gave it a pretty good weapon. Uh, I'd like to move into where we are right now. Uh, I'm gonna skip, about, skip some of the information about development, uh, such as the hotels and the condos, but uh, in the 40s and 50s, we had 60 hotels. We've now got uh, about 45, and we have about 150, 155 condominiums in our destination. Uh, when we market, we market to uh, leisure travelers. Uh, we do that on uh, over the internet. About 47% of our budget is spent on internet marketing, and uh, the rest is on TV, mostly on TV, and then some radio, uh, print, and billboards. Where we market, if you draw a circle uh, pretty much from New Orleans, but then jut out to Houston and Dallas, then come back up, go up I-65, hit St. Louis, and keep going to the east, uh, that's our market. Um, we have about a $3.5 million marketing budget to do that with, which allows us to be competitive uh, with all the other destinations on the coast. With that, I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to the, uh, to the general's comments. Okay, Gordy, you've got 10 minutes to tell us everything about Eglin Air Force Base in 80 years. <laughs> Thank you, David. Fisherman, Fisher, fish heads, right? <laughs> Ferris wheels and F-35. I'm here to uh, extend my congratulations to Destin on its 100th anniversary, and I want to tell you the armed forces have been a partner in this tremendous area over the last 80 years. Contrary to public public opinion. Uh, I was not there full time. <laughs> this this, this uh, wonderful time we've had here began in Valparaiso Airport, a small airport of 137 acres in Valparaiso in 1933. Contrary to that, uh, or just after that, uh, as mentioned, James Blue came down here from Chicago. That's Walt Ruckel's uh, grandfather, and leased up 1,460 acres to open what's called the Valparaiso Bombing and Gunnery Range. In 1937, uh, he leased, or uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Eglin 
uh, was killed in an aircraft accident uh, right after that, and the, and the base was named in his honor as Eglin Field. Shortly thereafter, of course, the country entered World War II, and uh, Eglin became a very busy place uh, with wartime preparations. In 1940, President Roosevelt approved $76,750 for 24,111 acres, which became, uh, which was part of the Choctahatchee National Forest. Shortly after that, the Forest Service ceded the whole National Forest to the service, and it became uh, the full Eglin complex that we know today. That was the first controversy we had here, and that all the hunters around here suddenly all that range, all that 274 miles were off limits. And can you imagine the first hunter controversy we had here at Eglin? Eglin became then the site for all gunnery training for all Air Force uh, pilots uh, during the war. Shortly thereafter, General Doolittle came down here with his band of, uh, of uh, B-25 pilots and, and crew members that had trained up at Duke Field. Uh, for their famous attack on Tokyo in April of 1942, and you may have seen uh, the, one of the last three survivors of the Doolittle Raid just died over the weekend. But during the war, there were battleship targets throughout the bay, uh, battleship-sized targets throughout the bay, which the fighter pilots and the uh, bomber aircraft attacked regularly, and saw the first women here in 1943, in fact. Uh, the first women came to Eglin. There were two officers, 149 enlisted, as part of the Women of the Air Corps uh, post uh, headquarters company here. Of course, we were being, uh, England was being attacked by V-1 buzz bombs at the time, and at the time we built a simulated, duplicated all those V-1 buzz bomb sites in Germany, and they, sir, they were mounted along the beach here and served as targets uh, for our uh, bomber and fighter pilots, and proved to be a very, very difficult target to hit. Uh, right after the war, the, the, the emphasis here became a technology and we became experts at missile launches and the development at that time, 1946, of drones and, and uh, pilotless aircraft. And in fact, in 1947, a, a QB-47, great big bomber, B-47, unmanned, flew from Eglin to Washington, D.C. and back to Eglin, unmanned, simulating a bomber attack on the nation's capital, which of course drew a great deal of attention. Lieutenant Colonel McKinley, a big McKinley Climatic Laboratory, was uh, formed at that time. He had, he had delivered aircraft all over the world and noted that in the extreme temperatures, minus 65 to plus 110 in all sorts of weather conditions, it was necessary to test those kind of airplanes and set a precedent here at Eglin. Every airplane that we've ever had in our service has been through this climatic hangar, so we've had every aircraft in the, in the world here at the, at the hangar, plus others. Uh, during the early stages of the Cold War, of course, we became the test center for missile launches uh, from the beach, and uh, that was the times of the Beaumont, the Matador, the, the Quail, the Hound Dog missile family that were all launched and tested here at Eglin. Our great big King Hangar was built then, and the new runway, runway 12130, the great big long runway, 12,000 feet, was built uh, at that time. As uh, Ed said, in 1957, the Okaloosa County Air Terminal opened with Southern Airways Service, you may recall, DC-3s, maybe some of you don't, and Martin 404s, it was commonly referred to as the Vomit Comet, the Dauphin. <laughs> 1940, in 1958, if you can imagine, uh, during President Eisenhower's turn, the State Department decided it would be very, very clever for us to actually have a, a live, a live nuclear test in the Gulf of Mexico right off here, launching Beaumont missiles, missiles with uh, live nuclear weapons. Uh, just one week prior to that test, uh, President Eisenhower halted that uh, because of concerns that Cuba and Mexico had, con had can you imagine, a live nuclear activity uh, out here in the Gulf. President Truman, of course, visited in 1950 for a big firepower demonstration which we held here. And in fact, President Kennedy was here as well in 1962 for a firepower demo. And that time in 62, that was when the special operations under Kennedy's administration, the shift to tactical forces and the Special Air, for Air Warfare Center was formed at Herbert. The old jungle gym program, if you remember, everyone's running around without their shirts, bristling with muscle guys. It was a 
It was a time uh, to be at Hurlburt if, if uh, any of you were around. 62, you recall, Cuban Missile Crisis. The field here was loaded with airplanes because of the Cuban threat. We built a new space track station, the F-85 out, out at C-6. The federal prison, commonly referred to as Club Fed, if you recall, about, 8, 000, about 1,000 prisoners we put to work every day at Eggman. And that was the time when the Strategic Air Command moved here. The 39th Bomb Wing arrived with their B-52Gs in 1962. Early Vietnam then, uh, the technology devoted to our gunships all began here at Eglin. And right at the mids of 1965, the B-52s left and the 33rd Fighter Wing moved in with their F-4Cs. That was the beginning of the laser-guided bomb technology and, of course, was used considerably during the combat uh, effort in Vietnam. We got a new hospital. The Mideast War occurred in, uh, in uh, 1967. And with the Israelis, we horse traded for a number of Soviet advanced radars. And we mounted those radars for a, a realistic threat environment all the way from Sandblast all the way to Navarre. Uh, our own Leroy Manor at that time uh, planned and executed the Sante raid trying to rescue our POWs uh, that were captured in Vietnam. That was a time, too, at the war's end in Vietnam, we had 10,000 Vietnamese uh, refugees arrive here, stayed out at the fairgrounds, and shortly after that, 1980, we had 9,200 Cuban referees, uh, refugees uh, up at Field 2. Bob Hope Village, Armament Museum, the EOD School, and the beginning of our foremost AMRAAM air-to-air -air missile here was the foundation of the Air Force's air-to-air -air world. Desert Storm in 1990, our uh, 24 F-15s from the 33rd 58 Fighter Squadron deployed to Saudi Arabia. They flew 1,689 sorties and had 15 kills in their time uh, in the war. Bunker Buster, you recall, developed in only eight weeks to go after deeply buried targets in Iraq. Our start of the GPS guided weapons there to pro provide all the precision in our weapons that we have today. And of course, our, unfortunately, our, our friends at the 33rd, there were 12 of 19 airmen that were killed in the Kobar Tower attack of terrorists made with a 5,000-pound bomb they parked outside the, their barracks. Cruise missiles began flying here. We launched missiles from over in the Atlantic Ocean across the land, impacting in our range here. Became commonplace, unheard of in earlier days. We developed the world's largest bomb, the MOAB, the mother of all bombs here, 30,000-pounder. And then shortly thereafter a year, we started on the very smallest bomb, the smallest small diameter bomb. Well, today, activity continues as always. Still the largest base in the DOD, 274 square miles, 88,000 square miles out over the ocean, and of course, the airspace above. The 96 test wing has about 8,500 military, civilian, and contractors working on the facility. There's 28 squadrons, 12 operating locations, and serve some 23,000 military civilian personnel uh, here. The turnover is occurring this summer. AFSOC is a new commander, and it's a very dynamic place right now. All sorts of things going, and the thing there is they've been in combat for 15 years. They have not taken a knee, a knee an athletic term, have not taken a knee for 15 years. We have the first SOW and the 24th, and those 24 SOW guys that you ever see, those are the guys eyeball to eyeball with those enemy terrorists over in the theater. Uh, we've had a BRAC 2005, of course, and that's where we got the F-35. Lockheed Martin won that competition in 2001. Seven countries joined the partnership immediately, and it, uh, the program's gone very well. The airplane you'll see flying here, it carries a 25-millimeter cannon, it carries two AMRAMs, it carries of either two 1,000 or two 2,000 pound JDAM bombs. We have 40 F-35s. You may recall we were granted by the economic and uh, uh, environmental impact statement of 59 airplanes. We have 40. All the Marine Corps airplanes have departed for Beaufort, which is now the Marine training site. Uh, we have just Navy and Air Force airplanes, 26 A's, 14 C's, which are the Navy version. Lockheed Martin still has 440 people working here at the 33rd. 131 F-35s have been delivered to the DOD, and eight bases have been selected so far for their, uh, their uh, bed down. 
They'll be at Edwards, Eglin, Lake and Heath, Nellis, Hill, Burlington, Vermont, Luke, getting 144 airplanes. You remember we were supposed to get 109, and didn't quite make the mark, and Isleson, Alaska. There'll be 3,170 F-35s delivered in 12 countries. The Air Force will have 1,763 F-35s. I think the future looks great for both testing and training here at Eglin. With 80 years of history, we have built a tremendous momentum for even more growth in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your service to our country and continuing to our community. And now we'll start with the questions. The way we're going to do this is so that Gordy can get to New York and refinance our bonds. We're going to, have, if you have questions for him, we'll start there, and then we'll uh, so that it, everybody gets their questions. Then we'll go down to Kelly and come this way with questions. So anybody have a question for Gordy this morning? And we have somebody with a mic right over here. Okay, so I'm going to ask the first question then. <laughs> what do you want to tell us about the Tri-County Agreement with Eglin? And yes, I'd be happy. I see my cohort here, uh, Sal, is here. But uh, a number of months ago, we began the, what's now called the Tri-County uh, Community Partnership Initiative. Uh, began as the Community Partnership Initiative. It was actually derived from congressional legislation uh, both in 2014 and 2015, which really encouraged and enlarged the ability for communities and bases to cooperate, both in shared services, real property activity, and things that we can uh, benefit from each other's assets. Uh, a group uh, got organized. We uh, officially charted it between Hurlburt, uh, Eglin, and the community, and uh, it is ongoing. We currently have nine projects underway that all uh, have tremendous benefit to the to the community they range from building uh, new reefs and i have to think when you're having a building destroyed or uh, what we're using is all the concrete targets which we've destroyed on the eglin range and we have to move that concrete off the range and it costs a great deal of money we're going to take all that concrete and things sterilize it of course as, as necessary and we're going to make a whole series of new reefs uh, which both for the fishing community and the diving community will be a great asset. So if you're tearing down, I saw Food World and Niceville being torn down, I was thinking, look at all that steel and concrete. I mean, those are the things. So if there's something comes to mind, you're tearing something down, you got materials that we can use in those reefs, uh, call Nathan That's uh, or Sal. Other, other, other projects are, are shared the services across the board very interested in energy uh, sharing, uh, medical training, uh, a series of other activities, but we have regular meetings and if you're interested or have some idea about sharing things with base facilities, real property that's available uh, now uh, around the base area, the base has an amazing amount of property that's never been utilized and available for potential um, extend our uh, leasing uh, or easement activity so there's uh, there's some activity that way uh, that's about where we are at the moment David now I have a uh, question that you guys have submitted so if uh, Paul would you like to ask one yeah general do you know if there's going to be another uh, general do you know there will be another round of uh, BRAC in the future Thank you, Paul. I, I do not know if they will, but our, our uh, contact, and uh, we stay very tuned to that since uh, uh, many rounds of BRAC that we've been through here, uh, the last being in 2005, uh, the, the activity uh, stays tuned up for those activities, but when we've been in, uh, in contact with our Washington representatives, both senators and congressmen in particular, uh, they have very uh, opposed to any BRAC activity. And our sense is that it won't occur uh, this year for sure. Uh, with the Republicans uh, in power now, they've been generally against the BRAC motion. It's the administration position uh, to go ahead with another round of BRAC. But the Air Force in particular has uh, been very public about saying it has about 25%, 25% excess capacity at the moment. So that's a great deal of savings to be had, which can be used for modernization and normal activities. So 
I would, we don't put it out of our mind. There, uh, you know, your, your EDC, the Defense Support Initiative, and others are actively involved in staying very tuned to that situation so that we can react as we did the last time uh, in opposing that and, and recognizing the, ver the, the true value which I tried to portray in, in my little uh, talk there about all the terrific things that uh, Eglin has contributed and Herbert and our whole community here, uh, the support that we get from all of you. I didn't, I didn't say that, but it began back at the Valpo Valparaiso Inn, Ed. We, that was our first USO Officers Club, and in fact, 1943, we had our first dance at the Valparaiso Inn. <laughs> That's our community. Okay, I know there would be other questions for the general, but we really need to get him off to New York to save us some money. So let's thank General Fornell for it. <laughs> okay, now, if you have questions for Kelly, now you have submitted questions, so I'll, um, I'll ask the audience first if you have questions, and if you don't, I will ask the ones that you've submitted. Does anybody in the audience have a specific question for Kelly? Okay, Kelly, let's let's uh, do the one that was submitted. Oh, go ahead. Uh, there's some idea about Recently, I started hearing about the connection between fishing and the military, and I thought it was pretty amazing. Can you maybe summarize in a few minutes uh, how the activity works between the military and the contracts, and how you help them blow things up? I guess. You have to hold. Oh. The, uh, the Air Force uh, periodically holds exercises in the Gulf. They do ordnance and target shooting and whatnot. And they always give us ample notice on what the range will be, how long it'll be, what days, et cetera. In fact, they uh, very recently, just a week ago, they, they employ probably, I'd say, 20 to 25 boats, something in that area, to help with this uh, this this ordinance out there, they the charter boats monitor the area, safeguard other boats from getting in there. Uh, we have a boat in our group that that takes uh, it recovers the targets sometimes pieces and and brings them back to to the shore. Uh, so really the uh, the little inconvenience that's caused on some boats uh, being able to fish in a certain area at a certain time is in my view outweighed by the the revenue and the opportunity that the boats get to participate and and be compensated by the government but i'd have to say that the military works well with the with the destined fishing fleet and uh, we appreciate it thank you kelly now let's go to greg and if we have time we'll go back to each panelist but let's now go to greg and let's see if anyone has a question for greg on manufacturing or if i get to use the ones you've already submitted to me here Oh, you don't want to know anything about manufacturing? I'm, I'm sure we can tell you something. <laughs> okay. So, Greg, what do you see as the plans to support the region in the future from a workforce perspective? Big deal in manufacturing. Yeah, it, it is a big deal. And, and, you know, we're focusing really at, from the EDC level at, at Tech Man. Like I said, there's a lot of things going on with training military and training even the workforce we have today. To even you know to the next uh, to the next level, whether that's you know additive manufacturing type things or whatever we need to do there to support the local businesses to, to for education, AS 9100, those kind of trainings. But from the manufacturers council side, we're really focusing on those seventh and eighth graders and and trying to get them interested in manufacturing at an early age. Um, and we've been very successful in doing that. Uh, I think we've passed uh, every one of the career academies so far, except I think we're still working on the regional level. But um, Mary Beth Jackson and Patty Benezzi, they've been uh, just very instrumental in, in looking out what's the best for our, our kids. And, you know, I, I even got to attend the school board meeting. And uh, it, the school board did their due diligence on, they asked a lot of hard questions. What, what does the future look like? How are we going to support it? How are we going to sustain it? And Patty and Mary Beth did a great job of getting back and saying, this is how we're going to do this. And it, and it passed for, for nothing. So. Anyway, so we're looking at that from a, the seventh and eighth grade level, and then also giving them a career path to go f in the future. You know, I look at it at Fort Walton Machining, we have an apprenticeship program, and it's no different to, than, than that. We bring kids in, we, we, we put our best machinists with them, we teach them a trade, they have money in their pocket, 
a lot of them go on to Northwest Florida State College, get program management degrees, uh, and as well as um, I've got an electrical engineer. I mean, he started out in, main, in, in uh, machining and uh, I think worked for five years at Foil Machining and went on to uh, became an electrical engineer. So there's a big push right now, and I think if you if you'd ask Nathan or you'd ask any of the economic developers that are going over and, and, and listening to the folks overseas or even people in the, in the northern part of the northeast, excuse me, northwest, like from Seattle or, or, or uh, California, and they're wanting to maybe move businesses here in this local area, their biggest question is, is how are you going to support us with the workforce you have today? Thank you, Greg, and thank you for your effort with the uh, Northwest Florida Manufacturing Council. Uh, you're bringing it, what you're doing, what you have to do, you start with the young kids, because if you don't start down there, you won't get them when they're adults. Okay, let's see if anyone has a, a question from the audience from, from, for uh, Ed, or I will uh, ask, the, well, I got a bunch of them. Y'all submitted a bunch of them to Ed, so does anybody out there have one that you haven't submitted to me? Okay, Ed, let's do this. Let's, let's take the hard one. Uh, what role does tourist development tax have in mitigating the incremental costs of tourism to a community? Uh, that is a tough one. Um, in our community, when you have 20 to 25,000 citizens uh, that live here year round, and then during the 100 days of summer, that balloons to 75 to 100,000 people there is clearly an additional cost put on our community by people who are not necessarily paying, paying all the taxes that the rest of us do. So is it fair to ask those people through their bed tax uh, to pay for the additional cost of the infrastructure? Uh, by that I mean the additional uh, damage done to roads, uh, curbs, uh, sewers, water, uh, and then the additional cost of policing. Uh, that group when they come here. As it stands right now, the use of tourist development tax is governed by Florida statute. Those statutes were created 20, 25 years ago when the lodging industry went to, to the state capitol and lobbied to have these taxes made available to promote the industry. So the original purpose of this was to create monies to advance tourism, to promote tourism, and that's how the statutes were written. They were not written to supplement infrastructure costs or the incremental cost of tourism. And that's where they stand today. Uh, there will be bills produced, I don't think this year, but probably next year and probably following years, to try to open that door to allow tourist development tax to be used by community leaders to help pay the cost of successful tourism. Uh, but today that door is not really open. Okay. Well, to paraphrase a famous quote, the business of Okaloosa County is business. And you're the folks who do that business, so it's now time for us to get back to doing business. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for the great turnout. Thanks to our panelists. Let's give another hand. Let's go do some business. Yet. I've got to close this out. False alarm. Thank you all for being here. Um, this has been great. And thank, thank you to our distinguished panelists. You know, at the outset of today, I said that we were going to talk about Okaloosa County's proud economic heritage. I think I'm going to amend that. Still proud, but after hearing about the vomit comet and the rum runners and the casinos, why don't we say proud and colorful? <laughs> But again, thank you all, and, um, and we have a lot of folks that made today possible, and I want to thank them very quickly. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Dr. Getch, an excellent job moderating, as always. <laughs> thank you to our sponsors, Chelco, PowerSouth, Warren Averett, and North Okaloosa Medical Center. Thank you all. And the Choctaw Honor Guard, I can't say enough about them. They just got back from spring break, folks, and they were happy to do this this morning. Let's give them a hand. And some other folks, certainly Choctaw, uh, excuse me, Cox Communications, Marsha Ride Reynolds, Gulf Reflection Studio. You always do a great job for us. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, we had an uh, excellent uh, volunteer helping us today with the mic. You may have noticed Daniel Ross with Nova Engineering. Thank you, Daniel, for helping us out. 
And as always, the Ramada management and staff, you all do a tremendous job. Thank you for what you do. And then certainly I couldn't do what I do without a very capable, competent staff telling me what to go and where to say and what to do. Um, and that is our EDC staff, Kay, Caroline, and now our new intern, Cameron. If you haven't met Cameron, he's from the University of West Florida, and he's doing a great job for us. And please say hello to them this morning. And then on your way out, we have a special treat for you today. You will have an annual report uh, from the Economic Development Council, should you so choose to take one. These are hot off the presses, folks. This is our 2014 annual report. It's the first one we've done in a while in a formal way, and it uh, has some great information about what your EDC accomplished over the past year. So as you leave today, you see uh, Kay and Caroline stationed at the doors on your way out. Feel free to take one of these, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much.